I've heard it said that the only difference between a meal and a feast is a glass of wine. Now, no one country embodies this statement more than Italy. We've covered northern Italy, Piedmont and the Veneto, and now we're heading to central and southern Italy. The cultures of the north versus the south vary greatly. In my family, we have a part from the northern Italy and southern Italy. And way back when, at family functions, one side of the family couldn't talk to the other side because they couldn't understand each other because their dialects were so different. Today's lecture is on central and southern Italy, and you'll need the following lines. A Chianti, or Chianti Classico, or Brunello di Montalcino, a Super Tuscan, here we have Sassicaia, a white wine from central or southern Italy, such as Greco di Tufo, Lacrima Cristi, Fialno, Falangina, or even a Chardonnay, Alianico, such as Torossi or Aliano, Alianico del Vertura, a Primitivo, and a Nero Davola. So let's start with Tuscany, the home of the ancient Etruscans and the winemaking region of Chianti. We have records that date as far back as the 7th century BC. Um, um, these wines were being exported from this area of Italy to all southern France. So this region of Italy has a long, long lineage of winemaking. Chianti is the most widely recognized wine after Bordeaux and Champagne, and that's according to a study done by Wine Intelligence in 2007. But what do you picture when I say Chianti? A lot of people instantly imagine at an Italian restaurant a, a red checkered tablecloth and a, a round bottom wine bottle with, in a straw basket with a candle stuck in it, you know, never mind the wine. For a while in this country, Chianti was considered nothing more than a casual entry-level wine. That's definitely not the case any longer. The quality of Chianti has improved incredibly. These are great wines now, yet still wonderful values. The first producer of Chianti we have here is Barone de Casoli, which began around 1141, and the family's original castle, Il Castello di Brolio, still stands there today. The Recasoli family is credited with creating the original recipe for Chianti in 1874 by blending two red grapes, Sangiovese and Canaiolo, with a white grape, Malvasia, and as well as Trebbiano, another white, was added in the 20th century. I visited the castle not too long ago. It was breathtaking to sit there in the Tuscan sun with a glass of Chianti Classico, just as I as I'd pictured it years earlier when I was standing, um, starting my journey into understanding wines. Back to understanding Chianti. I warned you that labels could be tricky in Italy, and you're just about to see why. The original delineation of the region of Chianti was officially decreed by the de Medici Grand Duke Cosimo III in 1716. This historic region is between the cities of Siena and Florence, and wines made from grapes grown within these original boundaries carry the label Classico. You should know that uh, other regions in Italy also use the Classico label. Now, although Chianti is a DOCG, remember that stands for Denominazione di Origine Controllata e Garantita, Chianti Classico has its own DOCG. Uh, its own DOCG status, separate from the larger area of Chianti. Also, there are seven additional sub-regions of Chianti that can put Chianti on the label. Uh, Chianti Colisanesi, Chianti Colli Fiorentini, uh, Chianti Rufina, Chianti Colli Arantini, Chianti Montalbano, yeah, you get the idea. Each one has its own specific terroir with its own unique characteristics. Did you know that Chianti was supposedly Ernest Hemingway's favorite wine? I've also heard that uh, he drank it every morning for breakfast. I don't know if that's true, but I can understand why he loved it. Chianti's red wine grape is Sangiovese, and it's also Central Italy's most important red grape variety. Sangiovese means blood of Jove. Uh, you might remember that in Roman mythology that uh, Jove was the king of the gods, as well as the god of thunder in the sky. The grape Sangiovese goes by different names throughout Italy, such as uh, Brunello, Brugnolo Gentile, and Moralino. These different names can be confusing. For example, there's a wine made with Sangiovese from the area of Montepulciano in Tuscany, and it's called Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. But there's also a grape called Montepulciano in the region of Abruzzo, called Mot Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, which has absolutely nothing to do with Sangiovese. Um, or the city of Montepulciano in Tuscany. 
I warned you it might be a bit crazy. Um, basically though, you're just looking to see if there's not only a great mention, but also a region, which means it's likely to be a better wine. If you have a Chianti Classico in front of you, let's taste it as we talk. Now let's take a look at the color. This is a you know, medium ruby, and it's slightly opaque. Um, this is actually seen uh, quite a bit of, of oak on it. It's a very high quality Chianti Classico from uh, Barone de Castelli. And um, let's smell it. It's moderately aromatic, but what you get is strong cherry-like aromas with a characteristic that is, is very, very herbal. And the type of cherry that you get is, is not your regular fresh cherry, almost like a, a sour cherry. You ever have um, choke cherries? If, if you're from the, uh, from the West, you may know what choke cherries are. They almost taste like that or smell like that. You also get some strong mineral aromas, which again points us towards the old world because European wines generally tend to have a mineral characteristic to the wines. But it smells ripe. It smells like ripe fruit. I mean, this is an indication to us that it's a, a warmer climate than in the North. But also some of the characteristic benchmarks I talked about was that those herbs, almost like, like basil or, or oregano, but it also has a, a meatiness in a glass. Again, like, like literally, literally like grilled meat. Now let's taste it. Generally, a lot of Chianti Classicos are medium bodied, but this one tends to be a bit more fuller bodied. And sometimes that means it has lower yield, so a higher level of concentration. Um, the body never really gets to the level of, of Cabernet Sauvignon, so we'll see that with the Super Tuscan. It never gets to that level of body, um, or like the Amarone we tasted in the last lecture. But they can be a little, uh, the tannins can be a little astringent. And that's one of the benchmarks for Italian wines in general. And for Sangiovese, one of the benchmarks here is that the acidity is quite high. This is what makes Chianti, Chianti Classico, uh, and Chianti Classico Riserva incredible food wines. I mean, it was made for Italian food. I mean, think of a, a, a ragu or a, a meaty lasagna or, or a bolognese sauce. And that meat will soften some of the astringency in those tannins. And, and you have the acid in the wine and the acid in the food from the tomato sauce. There's nothing better. Nothing better than all of that. As I mentioned, Sangiovese is also called Brunello, especially in the region of Montalcino uh, within Tuscany. This is where you get the wine Brunello di Montalcino. This area is south of Chianti, so the climate is a little bit warmer and drier, which makes the grapes a little bit riper and the alcohol a little bit warmer on your palate. The altitude of the hill of Montalcino is also higher than Chianti, and as we discussed in Lecture 3, the higher the altitude, the smaller the berries. That means a, a smaller pulp to skin ratio, which means a thicker grape, yielding a wine of higher concentration and more tannic grip. This is true for Brunello. They tend to be riper, more concentrated, fuller bodied, higher in tannins than their Chianti cousins. This is also why Brunello de Matocinos are generally higher in price than Chiantis. You may have also seen the word Riserva on the label. For example, Chianti Classico Riserva. The term Riserva is reserved for the wines that have met the minimum aging requirements for this designation. To be clear, these wines are aged the longest. They also have an alcohol minimum of 1.5% higher than other wines in a producer's portfolio that doesn't have Reserva on the label. This doesn't mean time only spent in barrel. It's aging requirement total for barrel and bottle. For example, Chianti Classico producers are not required to age at all in wood to put the, res, the, put the term Reserva on a label. However, almost all do uh, age in wood, but if they have Reserva on a label, the wine would have to be aged longer than the non-Reserva. Brunello di Montalcino is different. Of course, it would be too easy otherwise. The aging requirement in wood is two years, and the total aging requirement is 50 months. So Reserva would require even more time than that if the winemaker wanted to label it a Brunello di Montalcino Reserva. Remember in the last lecture when we spoke of traditionalist and modern international style producers? These regions have both styles as well. Traditional style producers age for a longer period of time in wood and in bottle. 
Additionally, the type of oak that's used is, is Slavonian oak, which imparts more of a, a subtle flavor to the wine. However, a group of traditionalists use older wood so that it imparts no flavor at all. Wine made this way with, with longer aging and, and more oxidation will have a, a paler color and take on more of an orange hue in the wine. Also, the aromas will bend more towards uh, spice and hints of leather more than fruit. Finally, the palate is softer. Uh, by aging this way, the traditional producer is focusing on harmonizing all of those elements. Modern style producers reduce the time in wood and generally use new oak, including new French oak, to impart a vanilla toast and spice to the wine. These wines will be more youthful in appearance, meaning more red-purple tones more than orange, and the fruit will be more pronounced. Speaking of modern producers, let's talk about super Tuscan wines. Some producers in Tuscany wanted to create a style of wine that would, it would include Bordeaux grape varieties and be of such high quality that it would rival the, the top growth in Bordeaux. And they succeeded. The super Tuscan wine Sasakaya, for example, which we have here, achieved legendary status when it won international tasting of Cabernets in London in 1978. Now let's take a look at the story behind this winning wine. In the 1940s, a winemaker named Mario Encesa della Rocchetta planted Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc on a tiny plot of land next to his castle. He called the wine made from this little plot Sassicaia, or Place of Many Stones. That's what it means in Italian, anyway. The, this wine is 90% Cabernet Sauvignon and 10% Cabernet Franc, so not a lick of Sangiovese or any Italian grape varieties. So, well, we know what happened with that wine. Years later, the Marchese Piero Antonori, a relative actually, created wines with Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. In his experimenting, however, he decided to include some Sangiovese and to age the wines in, in small barriques. These wines are of very, very high quality and today are worth about $200 per bottle. However, this, the winemakers at first counted a really big problem with this. The DOC and DOCG laws wouldn't allow these foreign grape varieties to be included and still designate the names DOC and DOCG. The winemakers thumbed their noses at the laws and created them anyway. Lucky for us. Initially, though, they could only have the designation of that lowly vino da tavola level that we discussed in last lecture. This caused quite a revolution and thus was born a new name, Super Tuscans. You won't see the word Super Tuscan on the label, but it refers to these IGT level wines. And remember, that's the second of the four Italian classifications of wines and stands for Indicazione Geografica Tipica. These are wines of super high quality that include Bordeaux variety grapes. These wines truly put Italy on the international scene for high quality modern style wines. As a result, in 1992, the government was forced to recognize these wines given their incredible reputation. They then allowed winemakers to call these wines IGT wines instead of vino da tavola. However, as we discussed in our last lecture, IGT is still a lower classification level than DOC, let alone DOCG. You may see wines at lower price points, such as in the $20 range, that try to call themselves Super Tuscans, but these are more like baby Super Tuscans. The term Super Tuscan in the trade really generally is reserved for those really high quality wines priced at over $100 that have Bordeaux varieties included, and generally new French oak. So let's taste the Super Tuscan. Take your glass and let's take a look at the color. It really is quite deep. You know, it's a very dark ruby color, and it's opaque. You can't see your fingers through it. Again, this tells us that it's made from a thick skin grape variety, which is Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Do the chest, chin, nose test. Hmm. Kind of have to stick your nose in the glass here a bit. I mean, it's not, it's not incredibly aromatic, but it's not mute either. But you get those Cabernet aromas, the black currants, the, the cassis, and I definitely get some, some toasty notes of, of, uh, of the oaks so of the vanilla. But there's also a hint of smoke here as well as um, some herbal characteristic. And this is actually what points you more towards Italy 
more than Bordeaux. If you had a Bordeaux uh, wine right next to this, you would be able to tell because it has those herbal characteristics. Now let's taste it. Definitely more full-bodied and, and, and powerful than the, uh, than the Chianti Classico we just tasted. Just much bigger wine. Very powerful, gripping tannin. But you can also tell it's a higher tier just in terms of its, its balance. It's balanced, but it's powerful balanced up here as opposed to balanced down here. It's got a long length, and even as I'm talking to you, the flavor is just going on and on and on. And it's got many layers of complexity as well. It's a bit tight right now. And when we say tight in the industry, we, we mean um, it's not giving as much as it could. And that oak is covering up the fruit a little bit. And this is a very, very youthful vintage. So when we taste a wine that tastes like that, we say, you know, it needs some time. It needs time to harmonize and let those flavors come through. A wine like this one, that's such high quality when it's so young, is, is quite masculine and unyielding. So you want to decant it, as we showed you in Lecture 8, not for the sediment, but to allow more oxygen to get through for the wine to soften up a bit. Have you ever seen anybody say, oh, we've got to let the wine breathe, and they open it, and they put it out, and that's all they do? It's actually a myth that this, doing it like this, is letting the wine breathe, because Think about the surface area that's seeing the oxygen. It's, you know, if you just open it and not pouring anything, it's about the size of a quarter. So you're not getting any oxygen to that wine. In order to properly aerate the wine, you have to decant it. So when you decant it, all that oxygen is, is going through as you're pouring. And this is softening the tannins and bringing out some of the aromas. It's also a good idea to open, decant, take notes, maybe every half hour after you've uh, decanted the wine. This will show you exactly how the wine evolves and changes. And you, you're going to be so surprised that the flavor is going to be different a half hour later, an hour later, to two hours later. Some people have decanted wines for parties that I've been to. They've decanted them like six hours in advance. So it's, it's, it's quite amazing to see all that change. Now let's turn our attention south. We're only going to highlight a few important regions, so if you want more, you're just going to have to wait for our next course on the wines of Italy. Here we have a white wine from Campania called Lacrima Cristi. The Campania region is home to Napoli, or Naples, and the ancient city of Pompeii, which was destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. So it's no wonder that these soils are very volcanic. Lacrima Cristi means Tears of Christ, and this wine has a legend of its own. When Lucifer was cast down from heaven, he fell into Vesuvius and began to destroy everything. In other words, he caused Vesuvius to erupt. Christ, hating to see his people hurt, began to weep. So his tears fell on the lava, which then caused vines to grow. Then the grapes used for this wine come from the grapes grown on that volcanic soil. La Crema Christi is made from a grape called Cora di Volpe. This is an ancient grape variety, and it's named for the shape of its clusters, which actually look like foxtails. So let's taste it. It's a straw color. It's not very aromatic at all. And here we get some mineral tones, but more of that benchmark characteristic I was telling you about with, with Italian whites. It has more of an almond kind of character. On the palate, it's, it's dry, it's fresh, it's crisp, and it's got some nice citrusy fruit to it. But it finishes nice and clean. Of course, there are other white wines in Campania, such as Greco di Tufo. Uh, the, the Greco Bianco grape was cultivated 2,500 years ago in southern Italy. But as the name suggests, Greco likely means it migrated from ancient Greece. Remember uh, grape plus region? Uh, Greco is the name of the grape, and it comes from the region of Tufo. The, the wine made from this grape is affected by the soil, and it's commonly called Tufa. 
Remember when we talked about Tufo in the lecture about the Loire Valley? You re might recall that it's the highly porous limestone and, and chalk soil with the volcanic vents going through it. Um, tufa is very similar. It's a vent-based volcanic rock. So Tufo, Tufa, get the connection? Greco di Tufo is known for flavors of orange, uh, apple, apple peels uh, with mineral tones. It's a fresh, crisp, and another bright wine. Then there's Fiano di Avellino. The name's derived from what the Romans called Vitis Appiana, a uh, vine loved by bees. Like the Coda di Volpe of Lacrima Christi, it's on the generous side of body for a white, and it's a, but it's a bit more aromatic. Um, it's got some notes of pears and, and even a hint of hazelnut. From Capri comes another uh, wine called Falangina, which you might have picked up. This was a, a prestigious wine of the ancient world. Italy's not really renowned for its in indigenous white wines, meaning they're you know, generally not creating them to rival something like the Grand Cruz of Burgundy. But many of them are very fresh, crisp, bright, and really quite affordable. They do make some wines from French grape varieties like Chardonnay. Again, because it's a French grape, they're not allowed to give it DOC or DOCG status, regardless of where it comes from. Italian Chardonnays are quite good values as they generally tend to be riper than those found in France. Uh, the climate is warmer and they have more sunshine. Here we have a red wine made with a grape called Alianico. Alianico makes up the, the wines of Torossi in Campania, and also this wine called Bocca di Lupo from Puglia, and that's the, the heel of the boot of Italy. Now let's taste it. What you may want to do is compare it in color to the uh, Sassicaia. And notice it's even darker uh, than the Sassicaia. It's richer in, in color, just more opaque. So this really lets you know that it's a very thick skin great variety. It's not very aromatic. But what I do get is very, very dark fruit aromas, like, um, like black plum, uh, blackberries. But here you get a, a smoky tone, a very spicy tone, and it smells like earth. And when I say it smells like earth, I, I do mean it kind of smells like earth, um, like dirt, but I also mean it smells like, uh, like the woods, like, like bramble, like we were talking about before. And it, it adds a layer of complexity to it, and it's kind of like exotic, and I like it. Wow. It's also really full-bodied and quite, quite tannic. Alianico is a late ripening variety. It's, you know, but sometimes when it's picked earlier, those tannins can get quite astringent. And um, they can be a little bit intense. But notice the acidity as well. It's, it's quite high, but it's balanced. It's also got a very long length, so you can tell this is a high quality wine. It's got the concentration, it's got the complexity, everything that makes up a high quality wine. And this wine, and in general, Alianico is one of the most underrated grapes and underrated wines in all of Italy. So if you're going to an Italian restaurant and you can't afford the Super Tuscans at over $200 a bottle, but you're looking for a masculine kind of put hair on your chest powerhouse red wine to go with that Osobuco, look to the Alianicos. Like uh, Torossi, like the Bocco di Lupo, and Alianico del Fertur, uh, which is from Basilicata. Uh, in the arch of the boot. They're absolutely fantastic finds. Another grape in Puglia, and again, that's the heel, is the Primitivo grape. The name comes from the ancient Latin Primitivus, or first to ripen. This is the opposite of Alianico, which is late ripening. The grape has seen some attention in the last decade or so because someone noticed it was similar to a grape in California called Zinfandel, which we'll discuss in Lecture 17. It turns out uh, that the DNA testing that these two grape varieties share a common ancestor, which explains the similarity in taste. Now let's taste the Primitivo. Also, a very thick skin grape variety. It's very, very dark and opaque. It's a bit more aromatic than the Alianico. And what you're going to find that it, it has a lot of red and black fruit, but it smells very, very ripe and almost jammy, almost similar to what you see for Zinfandel. 
And it also has this element of, of dried fruit in it as well, which is also very similar to Zinfandel. No wonder they thought it was the same as Zinfandel. Now let's taste it. In comparison to the Alianico, this tastes almost medium body. And if you notice on your back palate, there's definitely a warmth there. These are generally higher in alcohol because, you know, they're so, it's such a warm climate. And it's about 14%, but these can get up to, man, about 18%. And that warmth is due to that warm climate. This is another underrated wine, which means an absolute incredible value for you. Now, in Calabria, at the toe of the boot of Italy, um, makes some wines as well. But we generally don't see a ton exported to this country. The main red grape there is Galliotto, although we did show you uh, a Muscato Vino Passito in Lecture 9 from, from this area. Now to Sicily. It's the largest island in the Mediterranean, and it's the largest area under vines for any region in Italy, although the Sicilians consider themselves their own country. There seems to be a, a rivalry between the Sicilians and those of the mainland, which even migrated over to America. Uh, I, I was dating this boy in high school, and I brought him home to meet my family, and my Italian grandfather, um, when he met him, asked what his family heritage was. My grandfather didn't have a problem uh, with this boy's family being Polish, but he was half Sicilian. He had a huge problem with that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> when we finally broke up, my grandfather said, ah, well, you're better off without that Sicilian. <laughs> Sicily is close to the equator, so it's much hotter and drier than most of Italy. Since the Greeks inhabited the island in, in the 8th century BC, Sicily has been known for its high-quality produce, like, uh, like grain, citrus, and olives, and for its wines, which were sent to ports such as Pompeii. Most of what Sicily produces is white, but they do have one shining star that seems to be causing a lot of excitement with reds, called Nero Davola. Let's taste it. Well, it seems to be a thick skin grape variety. It's quite deep in color, a deep ruby. It's not incredibly aromatic, but it's not mute either, so it's in the middle. And now you really can smell that it comes from a, a warm climate because it, it's, it's really quite jammy. And you've got some dark fruits as well, and you've got a little bit of herbal characteristic. It's full-bodied as well, but it almost tastes, like I said, jammier, fruitier. So if you like warm climate wines, you're really going to like the Nero Davola. Now, what you may want to do is taste the Nero Davola, taste the Alianico, and go back to the Nero Davola. What do you notice about the tannins? It's probably going to be much softer, right? Yeah, the Nero Davola has a little bit softer, but that's not saying much because Nero Davola still has some pretty um, gripping tannins. You also see some French grape varieties here in Sicily, uh, like Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, the producer Planeta makes some. Syrah loves the sunshine here, and Syrah is sometimes blended in with Nero Davola as a blend. In Sicily, they have their own quality designation, which is marked with a Q on the label. So if you see that Q, you know that that is designated as a quality wine from Sicily. These wines can also be great old world deals and steals, especially if you like wines from warm climates with that, that jammy fruit, that fuller body, and a little bit of that warmer alcohol in the back if you can take it. Next up, we go from the chaotic and passionate culture of Italy to the precise, orderly, and logical wines of Germany and Austria. You're going to need the following wines. We have a Liebfrau We have a Spätlesa or an Auschlesa. Make sure that it's a Riesling. A German red, either a Spätburgunder, which is actually Pinot Noir from Germany, uh, or a Dornfelder, if you can find it. And then from Austria, you would like a, we would like for you to have a, um, an Austrian Riesling, a Grüne Veltliner, and a, a Schmarrg, if you can find it, um, and a grape variety called Zweigelt, which is a, a red grape variety from Austria. Germany is the home of Riesling, the food-friendly favorite of sommeliers. They can be great entry-level wines, and they can be some of the longest-lived white wines in the world. We'll also talk of the wines of Austria, 
which have been quite trendy with restaurants. You can be up on the lingo and, and talk shop with a sommelier. So until then, arrivederci.